Okay. So, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Marcus Volsky. This, as Alessandra pointed just out, is the first colloquium that we have in this new project of excellency of our department. So, I mean, this, we have now the money to have uh, a systematic uh, uh, program of colloquia, so that is the inaugural one. So, uh, Marcus Volsky was graduated in MIT, and now, as you can see, he is a professor at Berkeley. He has uh, written, um, I don't know, more than 100 papers on the uh, subject of uh, semi-classical analysis and many other subjects. And he has been uh, has many recognition and uh, is an editor in many journals. But I mean, OK, that is. Uh, but if you are interested in the subject of semi-classical analysis, then uh, the book. And then that's the book you should read. So that is absolutely the book you should read. If you find your way out. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so thanks. That uh, is a pleasure to have him to talk about from classical to quantum and back. So let's hope to come back. Okay. 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 Quantum is a little bit. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you thank very much for this introduction and for the invitation to speak. It's my second visit uh, to. to Around uh, two, and it's, it's very nice to be back. So I want to talk about you know this title from classical to quantum and back. Uh, so a little introduction. As Calangelo said, I I work in semi-classical analysis, which more or less means PDEs or spectral theory of PDEs at high energies. And in that subject, uh, we of we used uh, various results from classical dynamics and and. Uh, so, so in a way, we're using classical dynamics results, say, about ergodicity, and apply them to PDEs and spectral theory. And recently, there has been a development of using those methods, which were normally used to take classical results and use them for PDE and spectral problems, to actually use those methods to obtain results which are purely dynamical. And uh, so I will first talk about the first part, oops, sorry, first part, and then, and then I, will, I will try to go back to classical. But let me start with classical dynamics. And here is you know, one of the simplest to, to play, but uh, one of the hardest to analyze dynamical systems, and namely a billiard, uh, a billiard in the plane. And there are two, two billiards. Well, this is the more standard one, the rectangular one. And here it's a version of sort of Sinai billiard, where you have uh, these uh, convex boundaries or concave from the point of view of inside. And um, you, 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 you see the difference between these two billiards much more strikingly. If you send a 1,000 ball, 10,000 balls rather than one, uh, and uh, you can see that the one on the left, uh, the rectangular on the, on the, on the left, uh, the rectangular one is very somehow organized and predictable. Uh, I mean, that it's a completely integral system. Uh, I'm not going to, to talk about this. On the other hand, the one on the right, is chaotic in the sense that even though I start with some rather organized group of particles as far as location <coughs> velocity was concerned, once I let them go, after a while they are everywhere. So a more quantitative way to talk about it is to look at the equidistribution in position and velocity. So these are both moving with velocity equal to one, they reflect from the walls. Here is, uh, here is a graph of the number of particles inside of this little box. And as time goes on, it stabilizes and effectively becomes just the ratio of the total area uh, divided by the, uh, sorry, the uh, area of this guy divided by the, by, the, uh, by the area of the whole thing times the total number of particles. And here is the histogram <coughs> of the velocities, which you again see become uniformly distributed. And in particular, the flow is ergodic. So that means that the sets which are invariant under the flow either have measure zero or have full measure. And in fact, uh, 
you know, we will see some sets which actually have uh, measure zero and are invariant, but any type of bulky set will basically equidistribute uh, in the whole uh, billiard, both in positions and velocity as time goes on. Quantum uh, mechanics. Right? So, so now uh, here is an example of a result where classical mechanics or properties of classical system give you something uh, quantum. So this is the same, the same uh, a piece of this billiard table. It's, it's with symmetries the same thing. So here are my particles already at some time distribution, and here is the plot. I hope you can see it of a high energy eigenfunction. So by of the Laplacian. So what I mean by that is I take Laplacian. So Laplacian that's just uh, in the plane uh, dx squared plus dy squared, and uh, we say put the Dirichlet boundary condition at zero. We look at eigenfunctions and so we normalize them to have uh, one plus one. And here is a plot. This plot was done by Alex Barnett uh, 10 years ago or so, where you look at frequencies. So my, I square my eigenfunction, my lambda j is frequency. So eigenfunction is of size of a million. The frequency is about a thousand. And you can sort of see that this eigenfunction is everywhere in this video. It's in some sense as the so energy. So the, the, color, the, the color is the intensity. The so intensity, the intensity okay. yes, well, it's just the absolute the modulus of the yeah. eigenfunction, yes. So you can sort of see that it's sort of everywhere. And uh, as, as the frequency would increase even further, you would, you would start seeing fewer and fewer gaps in between. And the sort of basic, uh, an old theorem now about this is the term which was originally sort of postulated by Schnirelmann and then proved by various people. With Zeldich, we proved it for, for the general case of boundaries, in particular for this kind of boundary. And what does this quantum ergodistic term says? If my billiard flow is ergodic, in that case, there exists a sequence of density one of these uh, j's. So density one means, you know, number, okay. so we to say <laughs> in the math department what density one means. Density one sequence such that if I test my eigenfunction here, so this is just the L2 in a product, so, so I write uh, Fg is just Fg bar integrated over this, uh, this region omega. If I test it again, oops, sorry, against some function f, then this, this uh, sequence uh, goes to infinity. This converges to the average of f. So this really means that this guy somehow are, is in some weak sense, equidistributed everywhere, perhaps uh, except on some set of density zero. And actually a question whether these sets exist or not is, a, is an interesting topic of its own that I will not discuss. So uh, um, the, actually the statement is finer than that. So this is a statement about equidistribution in position. Yes, uh, you know, just like here. If I take a square of this eigenfunction, I multiply it by some function f, I integrate it as energy goes to infinity along this sequence of density one, I just converge to the average of f. But uh, we saw that the directions also equidistribute in this ergodic system. Well, that's actually a ergodic uh, system has to involve the direction. So actually, the statement is finer, and I will try to explain what it is. Namely, the equidistribution of the sequence is valid not just in position, but is also valid in phase space. So what does it mean that it's valid in phase space? And I will say, I will define this in a moment, or at least indicate. We, we, now we can take a function, not just a function in, in position, but a function in the cotangent bundle. So a cotangent bundle, to me in this case, well, in, in the case of uh, flat uh, domain, that's just omega cross R2. These are the positions, and these are the momenta. And, uh, and op H is a quantization of it. So if you, if you, uh, you know, uh, remember the graduate quantum mechanics, you start with the classical observable, which is a function of position momentum, and in quantum mechanics, we turn it into an operator. And this is this operator here, and uh, this is the classical observable, and what happens is that this goes, as energy goes to infinity, to the average 
of the classical observable on the unit tangent bundle, and HJ is my parameter, which is just the, the one of the frequency. That's the effective, effective Planck constant of the system at that frequency. Okay, so maybe please stop me if there are any questions, but let me let me explain a little more about this quantization procedure. So, so this is a one-page, uh, one-page course in my local analysis or semi-classical analysis. In that business, it's it's basically mathematical formulation of the semi-classical quantization from standard, uh, you know, quantum mechanics. Uh, you look at phase space. That's the classical configuration space. X is the position size, the momentum, or velocity. The semi-classical parameter it tells us at what wavelengths we are working. A classical observable is a function of position momentum. So for instance, a standard, a standard classical observable <coughs> is, uh, is energy, psi square plus V of X. And then a quantization turns this operator, this, this classical observable, into an operator by some procedure but the procedure is, is the one which says, well, x stays as multiplication by x, and momentum is quantized to be differentiation times, uh, times h over i, 1 over i, so that it is a self-adjoint operator. So for instance, this guy here, is, this is easy to quantize. If it's a polynomial in, in, in psi, easy to quantize. This becomes h squared Laplacian plus d, the Schrodinger operator. And uh, so basic examples, as I said, if you if your observable is just xj, then this is just multiplication operator. If it's just momentum, then it's differentiation. And uh, the classical quantum correspondence in this quantization procedure is this. And this is, if people disagree often, what are the quantization procedures and so on, everybody would agree about that one. At least I don't know anybody who wouldn't, but you never know. Uh, that a commutator of two quantum observables, which quantize classical observables A and B, is to leading order given by what's called the Poisson bracket of the classical observables. And the Poisson bracket is the application of, the, of A and B, is an application of the Hamilton vector field of B, of A to B. So this is actually a, 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 a kind of calculus definition in, in, in Rn. The way you should think about this, if this is my classical observable P, the Hamilton vector field of P, in this case, is twice psi dx minus gradient of V d psi. So this means that the classical, the curves of this Hamilton vector field are uh, simply given by x dot is equal to 2 psi, and psi dot is given to minus gradient of v, which are just Newton's equation. You have a space. I'm sorry. In the space. Uh, well, yes, of course. So I'm, you know, I'm, uh, in this case, the Hilbert space would be L two of x under some assumptions about what kind of a's I take. I'm, I'm being a little vague. Of course, there's a Hilbert space on which these operators act. I'm kind of being a little vague here, so my Hilbert space is C infinity. <laughs> <laughs> not a little bit space, but uh, but let's just say if, uh, you know, and and so this is the the quanta so so this means that commutators, well classically of course observables commute so this means I do have an H in the kind of classical limit H is equal to zero formally so this goes away things commute but the quantum the first quantum correction is given by the Poisson bracket which. Uh, corresponds to quantum mechanics. An example is, uh, is, is this commutator relation. Uh, in this case, you check that this is just a, the, you know, the value relation for, for the commutation of x, x i, and k. So, uh, in, so yes. what operator do you assign to a product of x i? Uh, ah, yes, yeah, yeah. so, so this depends what quantization procedure I choose. So in the way I wrote it, x psi would be assigned to r, uh, h over i x dx. So this means this is not a self-adjoint. 
I, I can also use the various, so the various quantization, quantization procedures, all right? So this is what one called the, the, I forgot, left or right quantization, which is very popular with PDE people. In, phys in physics or in algebra, what's more popular is the valve quantization. And in the valve quantization, one insists that uh, we go to cephadronic operators. In that case, the quantization would be IH. It's uh, something like the H over I, H over I, DX, X, this being a multiplication of them, in which case this is now a separate drawing doctor vector. But whatever quantization I choose, and if you say on a curved manifold, it can be a lot of different things. The key thing is that this property is always satisfied. Okay? And in fact, uh, uh, there is a theorem of, uh, there's an old theorem in physics called the uh, Gronewald van Hoeft theorem, which says that well, if you have a procedure of quantization, you want to keep this. You can never find a procedure which is exact and uh, uh, turns uh, commutators to Poisson brackets. And I was told that actually Dirac was very unhappy about this theorem, and actually, in fact, supposedly tried to block Gronewald's publication of Gronewald's paper because somehow it contradicted his vision of a more beautiful universe. So, but I don't know. So, so returning to quantum ergodicity, I remind you that, say, for instance, if I take a compact manifold, so, so not a billiard, but say a Riemannian sur Riemann surface, so this was the original setting of Zeldich's, uh, then uh, another formulation is that if I take the, apply this quantum observable to my eigenfunction, then along this uh, sequence of density one, you converge to the average with respect to natural measure, UV measure on the cos sphere bundle. Cos sphere bundle is just the unit vectors in the in the in the uh, cotangent bundle. Here it is, and this is the, the, the contact form. And so this is this is a statement, namely this guy here becomes an equidistributed with respect to this measure. So just to say what is a recent advance in this subject, it, it is a recent result of Diatlov and Jin who showed that for hyperbolic quotients, what happens is that no matter what, sequ uh, no matter what high energy sequence you, you have, this guy is always bounded from below. So please note that if, if I am on that sequence of density one, hmm, then of course this is bounded from below because it converges to a non-zero number. Okay. What is not known uh, and depends on the situation you're in, uh, is whether this happens for every sequence. In this setting, there's a conjecture of Rudnik and Sarnak which says that this should happen for any sequence. Not now, difficult, well, people try now for, for over 20 years. Uh, the, but what these guys proved is that at least you know that there has to be some of your any eigenfunction anywhere on the energy surface because you test it against any observable. This has to be bounded from below, independent of the energy. And this is based on, on the earlier work by Dyatlov and Zal and the work of uh, Burgen Dyatlov on something called the fractal uncertainty principle. So this is an example, a recent example of a result in which classical dynamics, because they use a lot about the classical strong hyperbolic dynamics on this, um, on this uh, uh, manifold, is used to conclude something in spectral theory. So to a mathematician, it's kind of quantum example. Okay, so I just want to say, you know, uh, because this is related to my next next topic, the, the again a quantum, so to speak, topic, or, or a PD topic, is that one of the things we use this sort of semi-classical <coughs> semi method is to understand PDEs and estimates on PDEs. And in PDEs, you know, the general question, one of the sort of obvious questions in PD is whether I have some operator which is a quantization of some classical observable. For instance, this guy here, I started with a classical observable, I got a differential operator. I solved the equation P equals F. Can I estimate U in terms of F? Well, you know, in some norms, without going into nasty details. So you'd like to, con and what, what is very useful in this business is that you may be able to have estimates which are local in phase space. In some places, you may be able to control this U by F. In some places, you may need some extra information. 
So, and then you can split it into pieces and then play with it. So this has been, you know, it's old subject, 70s uh, and so on. Then, so, so the easiest estimate, if you are in, in what we would call an elliptic region, namely that you are away from the place where P is equal to zero, the classical observable. You know, if I have an equation P equals F, P little p, I multiply two, f two functions. Well, I can write U as F over P if P does not vanish. And then I can write an estimate on u is less than or equal to f because p does not vanish. I can divide by it. Well, it turns out this is actually true on the level of operators as well. If I localize my function away from the place where p vanishes. On the other hand, if I am somewhere where p vanishes, so this you know there are too many dimensions here to draw. So now all of this is somewhere where p is equal to zero. You can still estimate u localized like this. But now you need to know you somewhere else, and this somewhere else has to control A as far as the classical flow is concerned. So namely, every point here has to come from some point here by the classical flow, for instance, this flow for this operator, uh, somewhere where B, uh, it's very hard to see where B is non zero, so that you know this actually is non trivial. So these are sort of Estimates. I, I'm stating this because my next topic involves propagation and understanding how classical properties of the flow are related to propagation of waves and properties of waves. So this is, you may argue that this is not quantum, it's classical, but that's where quantum analogs of that. It's just that it's easier to talk about the wave equation. So sorry for this many formulae, but uh, you know, this is, I'm, I'm going to talk about the wave equation. The wave equation outside of a body in three space. So think of some body in three space, like say myself, and uh, if somebody shouted at me, these are waves, they will reflect from my body, but they probably get absorbed and not. So. But uh, with some more bony person, they will get reflected uh, faster. And here we assume perfect reflection, we, we take the zero boundary condition on the boundary. And one question you can ask, will the energy decay exponentially yeah. If you sit in a compact set, so suppose you want to see if you know you, you send a wave, you then wait somewhere else. Will the energy go down exponentially as time goes to, to infinity or, or get large? And energy is defined for the wave equation as, as follows. But think about this energy in the usual sense: <coughs> measure of what? oscillations all added up squared. And the statement is that indeed you have positive rate of decay here, actually if and only if the obstacle is non-trapping. Obstacle is non-trapping means that every ray that hits it escapes after maybe a few reflections and is never trapped forever. So for instance, I am pretty much a non-trapping obstacle here, but if I do this, then suddenly I become a trapping obstacle because there is a ray here that reflects from the side of my arms that does not escape to infinity. And uh, the energy will decay exponentially even only if it's non trapping. So that was established a long time ago by Rolston, but it's still used, for instance, in general relativity, a recent adaptation was done by Spiersky. Uh, and so the other implication that non trapping goes by. Propagation of singularities, propagation of the kind that I just showed in this kind of cartoon, uh, and via methods developed again long time ago by Lux, Phillips, and Weinberg. So here is sort of an example <coughs> stolen from this one lab, uh, one lab uh, package of, of these two gentlemen. Here is an example of a wave interacting with a non-trapping obstacle, namely a circle. Well, you know, there's a nice shadow formed here, waves go by, everything will decay exponentially. Here is a trapping obstacle. Uh, so this is convex obstacles, but without the no eclipse condition. <laughs> so nasty, nasty thing. And you can sort of see some wave gets inside and sort of sloshes around uh, between these obstacles for a while. And this propagation of singularities for C infinity boundaries is actually a complicated subject, that, but it was sorted out now a long time ago uh, by various authors, especially the ones I cite here. Uh, but, when the but it turns out that actually uh, when the trapping is hyperbolic, for instance, well, our theorem doesn't quite apply to this case, but, but let's just say, uh, hyperbolic and sufficiently weak, 
Then we still get exponential decay, but the cost. Cost means that you have to pay a little bit in regularity, you can't just use energy. And this. But all I'm trying to, the, the method, the, 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 the whole uh, sort of message here is that classical dynamics determines whether you have exponential energy uh, decay or not. Okay. That's an example of a assumption from classical dynamics using PDEs to prove or disprove a fact about solutions to a PD. And there are many other aspects of this subject that, we, that are more recent. I mean, non trapping is defined by this? No, no, non trapping is defined like this. So I don't want to, to really give a technical definition with all the details, but non trapping means so, for instance, if I have some convex obstacle, if something uh, reflects, it, it's, um, it's non trapping because no trajectory will stay in a compact set for infinite amount of time. Okay? On the other hand, if I, will uh, if I will make a hole in this obstacle, well, uh, this sort of a hole like this, say, then what could happen is that you get in, and then if you're unlucky, you may get trapped in forever. Okay? Or you may have a situation like this, like a Helmholtz resonator, where basically you have trapped rays just inside of your cavity. Okay, so, so this is a geometric question, please. Omega. Omega? Uh, omega. Oh, gamma. 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 So, gamma. No, no, that's fine. Well, it's a very interesting question, and very little is known, as a matter of fact. So, since you asked, I, I didn't. But it's, it's, but it's a, if you just want geometric bounds on omega, uh, on gamma, uh, it's a lot. If you just want it, a universal bound. It's a low energy question, and 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 very little is known. There is actually an estimate of Ross to Morawitz. So these are famous results of Morawitz from the 60s and by Ralston from the 70s. That if you have O, which is contained inside of a ball of radius R, and it's a little better than uh, non trapping it's star shaped, star shaped. So star shaped means yeah. that basically it's a graph of a function on the sphere. Yeah. And so in that case, this gamma O is greater than or equal to one over R, uh, I think one or two over R. And it's optimal for the sphere. And in fact, I, I have a conjecture, without a price, but I'm willing to offer a price with a conjecture that if you if you, well, I forgot to say, he has a lot of conjecture. I have lots of conjecture with prices, yes. Yes, that's right, that's right, that's right, yes, yes. Well, you know, even if you're fast enough, even tonight, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, if this the conjecture is that if gamma r is equal to 1 over r, the obstacle is the sphere. But uh, for eigenvalues, there are many results like that, and they are not so difficult to prove. For this, well, maybe it's not difficult to prove, I don't know. You know, elementary the programs are uh, uh, challenge, you know, are sort of discouraging because there could be a very simple proof of that. One can show, uh, using actually, one has to use some complicated things to do this, that infinitesimally it's true. If I take a ball and I just deform it slightly inside the ball, then gamma has to go down. Okay. But uh, global argument, because these are non convex non self adjoint uh, optimization problems, which are very, you know, th th these are interesting problems from the quote unquote applied point of view. Mathematically, we have very little understanding how to handle them. But uh, so, uh, so I want to, uh, so, so, so the, 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 that's right, so the message here is classical mechanics, classical dynamics determines this exponential decay. And now, uh, so again, uh, here is an example uh, what, what else happens, uh, which, which again has an analog in dynamical systems, is that if you take a, a wave, this wave that we have outside of a convex obstacle, it actually, which is non-trapping, then actually it has an expansion not unlike the expansion that you get for eigenvalues. You know, we all teach, uh, well, uh, Actually, they're trying to remove this from our curriculum now, uh, basic curriculum. But you know, we teach, we used to teach our students that if you have a string, you expand it in Fourier series, you can solve the wave equation. Basically, this is a method of solving the wave equation for a string. You, these are the 
these are the eigenfunctions and this would be the eigenvalues. Well, here you do this in comp you, you only have this expansion varied in compact sets. This decay, the remainder decays exponentially if you sit in some compact set. And this lambda j, these frequencies, are now complex numbers in the lower half plane, which are called scattering poles. And since they are in the lower half plane, so let's hope I got it right, imaginary part of lambda j is negative, so then I have i, i, and minus, minus, so it's, it decays exponentially. So this provides a finer understanding of exponential decay of energy. And you can, so, so, so um, and how are they defined? Well, you have to do something, but they are defined uh, using stationary methods. Namely, you look at the uh, uh, Helmholtz equation, so this will be just quantization of this guy here, with a boundary condition. You can solve this using a green function, standard thing, green function, uh, and you solve it so that in the upper half plane you get uh, something which decays exponentially, so, so it takes L2 to L2 here. And it turns out that this guy here, if I fix x and y, has a meromorphic continuation in lambda. And this lambda j turns out to be the poles of lambda. So even though the interest and the notion itself is intrinsically dynamical, the nicest definition is stationary. You we'll see an analog of that in dynamical systems. So here's an elementary example. Uh, is namely compactly supported potential on the line. So you take the wave <coughs> equation on the line, potential is, is, is just lives in some compact set. So this is how the solution looks like. My potential, which I will draw here, this is the potential. So you, you send some wave. Most of these waves go through, but then some of it sort of sloshes around here in this trapping produced by the potential, but then slowly it gives out some energy. And uh, if you would look at the signal, the, 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 the amplitude of, of W in the very middle, you see something like this. And if you applied harmonic inversion formula to this, you would get the lambda Jx. And people actually do this. Can you use the complex relation? Oh, okay. yes. So, so you uh, you clearly very informed. <laughs> so yes, of course. So you can. You, you can do this, and that's certainly an efficient way of doing it. Actually, from the point of view of um, numerics, for this kind of problems, it's easier. This is a numerical calculation, which uh, the, the credit got lost here. It was done by David Bingo. Uh, it's actually, there's a link on my home, this code. It's actually easier to actually turn it into a certain nonlinear eigenvalue problem and do it directly using that in one dimension. This is, he assures me that these guys here, these are the lambda j's for this guy, they are computed to six decimal points. And, you know, he could do it to any number of points, he says, but you know, that's okay. So you can see that the ones which are close to the real axis, they're the ones which, which are sort of dominant because they have low imaginary parts, so they don't decay that fast. And in fact, so this is since, you know, it's Italy. So the, the one, uh, the person who sort of initiated the study of these guys uh, in the sort of quantum mechanics was Tullio Reggi a long time ago. And in some special cases, he proved actually an asymptotic formula for the number of, of this, uh, of this uh, scattering poles. And that was my undergraduate thesis, was to actually prove this mathematically. That's how I started in this business and never, never left. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what sort of 30, 30 years ago? I want to say 40 years ago, but it seems like 40 years ago. So now let's go back to classical mechanics now. So I remind you of this picture here, the picture in which, in which um, you have this billiard, which is where the flow is chaotic, you get equidistribution. And the sort of typical questions that one asks in dynamic motion, as you can hopefully could be confirmed by Professor Liberani here, is that for instance, how long do we have to wait before we achieve uniform distribution? That's an interesting question. And the other question is, are there periodic orbits and what information they contain? Poincaré told us, at least in France, for over 100 years ago, we should look for periodic solutions. And uh, of course, it's kind of hard to see at first that there could be periodic solutions in this mess here. And in fact, uh, I will talk about cases with my, my math, the mathematical result I present not for billiards, but there's recent work about precisely the question of this decay uh, by Baladi, Demers, and Liberani. 
So uh, one way to study these dynamical systems or study periodic orbits, and it turns out it's related to this question of how long do we have to wait before we have this uniform distribution, is to have an analog of the Riemann zeta function in dynamical system. And that is something called the Ruel zeta function. And the Ruel zeta function is a generating function for closed orbits of the system just the same way as the zeta function, Riemann zeta function is generating function for the primes. And well, here is an easy periodic orbit for the billiard I showed, namely the bouncing ball orbit which goes between the two sides. These orbits are very unstable. I started, the blue one is the periodic one. The start, the red one, is one which started very uh, close in position and direction, but as you can see, uh, it will, I mean, started all, at first it looked almost the same, but um, as time goes on, it is somewhat completely different. Yet it turns out that um, this plus some information infinite about infinitesimal behavior in a closed orbit gives us a lot of things about the properties of the flow, such as, for instance, the amount of time we have to wait before we achieve uniform distribution. So here is the Ruel zeta function. In my convention, I don't put a minus one, but of course, you know, that's just a matter of, of, of uh, taste or whatever. I have my reason that will come up why I do this. And these are, we call it the primitive closed orbits or prime closed orbits. You know, I only consider an orbit when I go around once. I don't want to count the length if I go around many times. And as I said, it turns out that the zeros and poles of this zeta function and of some related zeta functions provide information about the statistical properties of periodic dynamical systems. And for instance, that includes the time at which we achieve uniform distribution, which is a zero of a different uh, zeta function, a little more complicated zeta function, but one that's needed in the study of this zeta function. So these dynamical zeta functions have been studied by many authors. This is sort of a list of some names that, uh, that but, but every time I look at this list, I learn that somebody else uh, and normally it happens that I go somewhere and I realize that somebody uh, that is there has actually done something about the dynamical zeta function. So, and, and, um, so this, for instance, so there's a closely related dynamical zeta uh, function of Selberg, which, um, I mean, I, I, I won't uh, write it down, but it's, 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 it's almost equivalent to the well zeta function. And here is an example of the distribution of zeros of the well zeta function for a non-compact surface, so this is a length of closed orbits on this non-compact Riemann surface. So this Riemann surface has this big end here. And uh, that Riemann surface is determined by three parameters, the length and an angle. So the length, length here is 10, 10, and pi over 2. Uh, and here, oh, sorry, pi over 2. And here is 10, 10, pi over 2.1, uh, 2.01. So I'm just changing the angle here slightly. And uh, this is the, the zero, the, these are the zeros of the zeta functions computed by Bob using methods which go back to Svitanovich and Eckhart, and of course, whoever. So, and Smale, uh, a long time ago, conjectured that for a loss of flows, or, or for even more general flows, this uh, zeta function is meromorphic in all of the complex right? Uh, and in fact said that, um, I learned this actually first from the paper by Giulietti, Liberal, and Policon, but, but, but I, you know, it says Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. So I did check that he did, actually, actually, he did actually write it. Yes, in, there was in a marker paper. that you said, I didn't know. That okay, that yes, but I, yes, well, yes, he is very learned. So I, I, I must admit the positive answer would be a little shocked. Well, he doesn't look particularly shocked. But uh, he even said it's a wild idea. I read the, that. Um, uh, actually, I read the paper recently, so I had to. But now, what is an Anosov flow? So, an Anosov flow, well, is a, is a flow on a compact manifold. So, flow means, you know, I have some family of diffeomorphism depending a group depending on t uh, coming from a vector field. So, it's exponentiation of a vector field, so the, which does not vanish, and at every point the tangent bundle decomposes into neutral direction, stable direction, unstable direction. So I'm sorry, I, 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 Kyle Antro really saw me do this. The best way to visualize it is to, to with, a, with a little dance. 
which is this. Suppose I'm, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm looking at geodesic flow on a surface. In that case, my, the, the geodesic flow actually takes place not on the surface, but in two dimensions of the surface plus the directions. Okay? And so this means we are in three dimensions. So three dimensions means like this rule here. And then trajectories go with the flow. There's some flow, the trajectories go like that. And uh, this decomposition means that I have a neutral direction that's E0. It doesn't change at all. That's the direction of the flow. And then I have the unstable direction. Let me be, yes, the unstable direction, which, which in this picture is, is, is like that, which means that if I have vectors in the unstable direction, they get stretched as I go along the flow. And then I have a stable direction, which basically does the same thing, but in the opposite time direction. And Go down. This is a difficult. This is a difficult condition to verify, because it's global. This is supposed to hold for all times. Hence, even though it looks very innocent when one does this little dance, it's uh, easy to verify on a, in the case of constant curvature, say dimension two, negative uh, uh, negative constant curvature. But it's tricky uh, to do it in general. I don't know. And also was first to do this or. I think that no, it was the hyperbolicity is much older. Well, no, but to prove it for arbitrary negatively curved manifold. Mm -hmm. Well, in any case, but we, think it was we don't know who did it, but we know it's true, which is the important part. So here is the crucial example, namely the flow on compact Riemannian manifolds of negative curvature, in which case this is just position and unit length and directions. And the conjecture of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Smail uh, about the paramorphy of the zeta function was proved first by Giulietti, Liberani, and Polycott. Uh, uh, and uh, then after that, uh, Diatlov and I gave a proof which uses uh, these methods of uh, microlocal analysis. In particular, we used uh, an appro micro local approach to an also flow due to four Shestrand, who somehow uh, made the uh, pre micro local presentation of certain spaces introduced by many authors, including Calangelo, but also Baladitsuji and other authors, in a way that were sort of comprehensible to PD people. But of course, what we did there was incomprehensible <laughs> to the other people. But and, and something called the radial point propagation estimate. So again, along the lines of this propagation estimates or propagation as I kind of indicated vaguely, but it's a little bit trickier. They were first introduced by Melrose in scattering theory and then developed by Vashi and, and also we had some other developments. And the axiom A, which actually was the original setting of uh, Smell's conjecture, uh, is, uh, is the following uh, setting. I'm not going to give a technical definition, but roughly speaking, you are allowing fixed points as well, in addition to, to closed orbits. But these fixed points have to be hyperbolic, and the decomposition is only allowed, is only assumed on some subset of X, namely it's actually called the non boundary set. So, so it's a more, a much more, actually much more general situation than one also flows. And, in this, and this was actually the setting of Smell's conjecture. In fact, his conjecture was for, uh, I, I, I've forgotten now, suspensions of which are not axiomatic. And this was proved, this conjecture was proved by Diatlov and Guillermo. Uh, they sort of put finishing touches on, on it just this year um, uh, that uh, for any axiom flow, this dynamical zeta function is very more. So, kind of, this is a schematic kind of cartoon presentation of what was the, the, the point of, say, the. the, the uh, philosophical insight of, of, of foreign Shestrand, well, was to make the analogy with scattering theory. Well, in scattering theory, we consider the Schrodinger operator like that, where V is some potential that, say, uh, will be going, say, to zero at infinity. If I look at the set Xi squared plus V equals to, uh, to say, energy one, and my V, say, looks like that, and this is my energy, then P equals to 1 looks like this. Yes, I have a circle from here in X and Xi, and I have these two things here. So in the scattering theory, we study what happens when X goes to infinity. 
And Xi more or less stays bounded and momentum, even though its mere presence causes technical difficulties. Now, in the case of a dynamical system on a compact manifold, you, you can say what's capturing it? There's no infinity. X is bounded. But what is the operator which we can't I scale? Well, we just look at the generator of the flow. Generator of the flow is a vector field. So it is a quantization of a function which is linear in the momentum. It's simply the psi, the momentum, applied to the vector uh, field the, at the point x. That is the p of x psi now. And that, when equal to 0 or equal to any value, is non-compact. So you have scattering now in the psi directions, which corresponds to regularity properties. And uh, somehow, if one had a cartoon presentation of, of the work with Yadlov, we, we use the global propagation and some propagation estimates along this flow, including the, the trickier propagation estimates near this point here. And the Atl of Gear moved because they had now a possibility of both escaping Xi, but also leaving the long wandering set. Uh, the picture is, is more complicated, and then the work is more complicated. So again, from quantum to classical, the, somehow the, the scheme, the, 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 the scheme uh, or, or if you like, the analogy with what I said is the following. I have an anosov flow, let's say on a compact manifold, is generated by some vector field. The analog to the Helmholtz equation or Schrodinger equation is the equation x over i minus lambda u equals to zero. I put this i here because of my sort of being a you know, wannabe <coughs> mechanician. If there is a Measure if the flow is measured preserving, the next over i, at least on functions, self adjoint. So that's why we put the side. That so that's the analogy. The energy surface, well, is now the energy surface is just a place where the uh, classical observable corresponding to the generator of the flow is equal to some energy. The scattering, which means that one goes to x uh, in infinity, now corresponds to singularity, so I go to infinity. The propagator, sorry, the correlations, correlations, well, these are correlations uh, you evolve, say, by the wave equation, you measure against another function, uh, you now uh, do classical correlation. This is nothing else but the pullback, this sort of shredding a propagator, that's why I like this i here, even though it seems completely stupid. Uh, that is the pullback by the flow. And uh, I had expansion of this thing in terms of the scattering poles. It turns out there's an expansion here in terms of uh, something called Bruel, uh, polycode Bruel resonances. An exponential decay of waves through the wave equation, in some sense, is analogous to the decay of correlations. There's, of course, it, it's not, a, it's more related to the sort of hyperbolic uh, set case that I, I mentioned with Donnenmacher, but but morally, it's, it's, it's the same type of thing. So this is kind of a, of course, technically, technically there are, there are differences, but, but somehow morally, this is very helpful. So I will finish with another uh, small application of this technology, uh, namely how uh, we can, we can uh, uh, you know, use this uh, uh, quantum uh, uh, to classical, uh, micro-local methods to prove something new. So I, I will. Uh, so far, we can only do it in the simplest case of a, of a Riemannian surface. So Riemannian, not Riemann surface, non-constant curvature, smooth and oriented. So so uh, this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, uh, so the the only topological invariant of this surface is the genus, the number of holes. So this one has uh, I don't know, one, two, three. Six, so genus six. This is a surface of genus six, and uh, here is a result which relates uh, topology uh, to uh, uh, to uh, the dynamics. So in the case when there's no boundary, just like in this picture here, the order of vanishing of the zeta function at zero is equal to two g minus two. So in particular, I know this sounds ridiculous, but in the non-constant curvature that apparently was not known. That means that the length spectrum determines a genus. So the dynamical information determines a genus. Of course, it's kind of ridiculous because you know infinitely many numbers determine one number. <laughs> and of course, you can't tell how many numbers you need to determine this one number. So, but, but you know, this is mathematics. I'm not saying this would go to save lives, you know. 
uh, improve communication or something. So, so uh, this is, and recently Hatfield uh, generalized this to the case of manifolds uh, with boundaries, strictly convex components. So you could simply cut it along those geodesics here. That would also be fine. And then uh, what you get is is uh, a different answer, and the methods are more complicated. Uh, uh, that uh, the order of vanishing is equal to this, which specialists will recognize as one. So this is minus the Euler characteristic. This is one minus the Euler characteristic of the surface. But and actually, that result, even in the non-constant, sorry, even so, in the constant curvature, this is uh, this is this follows from the from the uh, Selbeck transform was noted by Fried uh, already you know, thirty years ago. Uh, but in the in the case of constant curvature, but non-zero boundary, uh, that only was observed that this uh, or proved that this 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 result of Hartley was only proved recently by Guillermo, uh, Hilgert, uh, and Weish. Okay, well, well, thank you, thank you very much for for your attention. Yes, in which you send h bar to zero, but so h bar is constant in nature. So can one say well, something? Well, 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 no, h you know h bar is constant in nature. But you see, when I write uh, the Schrodinger equation like this, uh, of course I'm missing all sorts of other constants and units. So specific problems have different values of h. So for instance, if you do Bohr-Oppenheimer approximation then H is really one over the mass. You know, they are very, it's a small yes, parameter right. of the yes, problem. Right. So it's, it's, it's an asymptotic uh, analysis uh, that may or may not apply to a given situation. Uh, but in many uh, problems, the asymptotic results work even when H is equal to 1. You're not so there. there are results also for each part phase? Well, no, they are all asymptotic. Oh, so. all asymptotic. Well, I mean, uh, of course not. Okay. There are plenty of results for this operator. <laughs> That's h equals to h is fixed, yes. But my results are all about uh, asymptotics. So, so h uh, is assumed to be very small. But what I'm saying is that if you put it on the computer, not always, sometimes it's not true, but often it works for very large values of h. This is like the physicist doing, which actually is an amazing thing, that you do say large, uh, large n limit, and n is the dimension of your space. You get asymptotics, you put n equals to 3, and you get actually good agreement. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, it, we do, it is true, we do not do estimates, which, because that's kind of a fool's errand, I'm like, I don't know where, but, but uh, it's, it's difficult and unrewarding to try to just compute the constants you know, when I say O of H infinity, that means that for every n there exists a constant Cn such that it's Cn to the power H to the n, uh, times H to the n. Well, computation of Cn would be just hopeless and kind of rather discouraging because I fear to imagine what sort of monstrous numbers you would get. Thank you. I remind to you that there is a, a refractor in the proper room and that's a